Hey, this is Sketchy. We're a learning company and this podcast is a review of the material meant to be used in tandem with our videos, quizzes, and symbol explorer to help the lessons stick. Or use this to passively review a topic while you're on the go. Check out the link in the episode bio to watch the video that goes with this podcast. All right, let's get started. <laughs> in this sketch, we'll focus on one of the most common winter illnesses in kids. Bronchiolitis. <laughs> it's also one of the most frustrating illnesses for pediatricians and parents alike, so... Stay tuned to find out why. For this sketch, we'll venture into a wintry forest of never-before-seen snow-covered bronchial trees. Except something's strange about this forest. It appears to be occupied by some ghostly campers. But these specters don't seem that spooky. In fact, they appear downright friendly. So hop into your up-and-at-em machines and let's dive in. Bronchiolitis, depicted by the inflamed red fruits on the tips of the bronchial trees, is a viral process characterized by initial upper respiratory symptoms, such as rhinorrhea and nasal congestion, that progresses to a prominent lower respiratory inflammatory process. The most common cause of bronchiolitis, seen in 80% of patients, is respiratory syncytial virus, or RSV. Gasper, the friendly ghost, the mascot of this ghost camp, is chillin' next to an RSV tombstone to help remind you of this. Other possible viral causes of bronchiolitis include rhinovirus, parainfluenza, human metanumovirus, influenza, adenovirus, and coronavirus. The regular one. We're not talking COVID here. The clinical features of bronchiolitis are the same, regardless of the causative virus, but RSV and co-infection with multiple viruses tends to cause more severe disease. Bronchiolitis is the number one reason for hospitalization among infants and young children in the USA, which is why the number one on this tombstone is the only number that hasn't faded away. So, what happens physiologically to the airways in bronchiolitis? The viral infection leads to lower respiratory airway edema, represented by these icicles dripping fluid off the bronchial tree branches, increased mucus production, depicted by this sticky accumulation of sap, and eventually sloughing and necrosis of epithelial cells within the airway, denoted by the sloughing bark breaking off of the tree. Just looking at this picture of goopy, drippy, shedding bronchioles makes me want to get bronchiolitis. Um... Never. All of these changes lead to obstruction of the lower airway, kind of like how this chubby squirrel is now obstructing this hole in the tree. Someone ate a few too many nuts today. There's a classic pattern to the disease course of bronchiolitis, and knowing this pattern will help as you assess a patient's clinical status. There's an initial prodrome of pretty standard upper respiratory symptoms, for example, rhinorrhea and nasal congestion, which is then followed by the onset of lower respiratory symptoms, which includes cough, trouble breathing, and wheezing and or crackles two to three days later. These lower respiratory symptoms generally peak in severity around days three to five. We'll talk a lot more about the details in just a second when we review the history and physical exam. You might hear pediatricians refer to the winter as bronchiolitis season because, at least in the northern hemisphere, it affects patients primarily in the fall and winter. That's why the Gasper Ghost Camp is held in the dead of winter. I prefer a nice warm summer camp, but that's just me. So, who tends to get bronchiolitis? Bronchiolitis usually affects children two years of age and younger represented by the two candles on Gasper's birthday cake. Or I guess it's his death day cake? Do ghosts even eat cake? Or eat at all? Egon, I have questions for you. Kids under six months of age, and especially those under three months of age, are at risk for more severe illness. You can see this depicted by this rough-looking corporeal cake, which only has half a candle. I guess ghosts don't like real cakes. Noted. So, how do kids with bronchiolitis typically present? 
They will come in with a cough, represented by this puff of air coming from Gasper, as well as a fever, which is seen in about 50% of cases and is depicted by Gasper's flaming head. Getting a good history is also important, as patients will often have had an upper respiratory prodrome, usually consisting of a runny or stuffy nose, and pictured here by the ghost mom blowing her nasty, or shall we say ghastly, nose boogers. Gives a new meaning to the term boogeyman, doesn't it? Get down, boogie, oogie, oogie. Uh, where was I? These nasal symptoms typically last for a couple days, followed by the onset of cough and trouble breathing. Looks like the ghost dad is coming down with something, too. Infants less than two months of age may present with apnea alone and no other bronchiolitis symptoms, shown here by this apneic ghost baby. Parents may also report that their child is making fewer wet diapers than usual. This trickling sap from the bronchial tree and this puddle of yellow snow should help remind you of this. This can be a sign of dehydration related to insensible losses from their increased respiratory effort and or from decreased PO intake secondary to nasal congestion or reduced energy, represented by this falling slice of cake. When I'm sick, I certainly don't want to eat much either, but I'd have to be pretty darn sick to pass up chocolate cake. Mm -hmm. When taking your history, be sure to ask about risk factors that can increase the chance of more severe disease. An age under 12 weeks and a history of prematurity can both put an infant at risk for more severe disease. You can see this represented by these three moon eggs. One moon covers the span of one month, remember? And this tiny owl that has hatched prematurely. In the case of premature infants, this increased bronchiolitis risk is because they have a greater chance of having underlying laryngo or tracheal malacia, or a floppy airway, and may have missed the maternal transfer of some protective antibodies in utero. Other risk factors for severe bronchiolitis include chronic lung disease or bronchopulmonary dysplasia, represented by these wilty, lung-shaped leaves, hemodynamically significant congenital heart disease, depicted by this jagged, crossed-out heart carving on the tree, daycare attendance, symbolized by this little gathering of ghost kids around the campfire, having school-aged siblings, aw, look, little ghost twins, secondhand smoke exposure at home, see the smoke coming from the fire, and a lack of breastfeeding in early infancy, hence this formula bottle. The next clue to a diagnosis of bronchiolitis is your physical exam. Pay careful attention to the lung exam, as that will usually really cinch the diagnosis. Don't forget to check and review vital signs for all of these kids. In addition to a fever, persistent or transient oxygen desaturations may also be present. You can see this represented by this living boy who, with the help of his glowing red ghost detector ring, has stumbled onto the ghost camp. You may also see tachycardia, which is depicted by his elevated heart watch. Next up after vital signs, be sure to check the overall appearance and mental status of these kids. Altered mental status, manifesting as lethargy, increased sleepiness, or decreased interaction with others, may be a sign of more severe illness, and is represented here by our ghost-detecting kid, who is scratching his head in confusion. I'd be a little perplexed myself if I stumbled on a group of ghosts sitting around a campfire, let alone one drinking from a baby bottle, no less. Next, you'll want to check for signs of dehydration, depicted here by this falling water bottle. Signs of dehydration can include dry mucous membranes, a sunken fontanelle in infants, and or delayed capillary refill and poor skin turgor. Next up is your lung exam. Before jumping to auscultation, check for signs of respiratory distress. These include nasal flaring, which is a reflection of increased airway resistance, grunting, which is the body's clever way to create auto-peep, or positive end expiratory pressure, to help keep the airways open, Accessory muscle use, like belly breathing. Retractions, which may be subcostal, intercostal, and or supraclavicular. And tachypnea. You can see these signs represented by our living kid who is huffing and puffing so much after his encounter with the ghostly campers that he has stretch marks on his jacket. Okay, okay, okay. Now you can listen. <laughs> 
on long auscultation, you may hear rails or fine crackles, which, if you remember, sound a bit like opening Velcro, kind of like the straps on our ghost hunting kids' shoes. You may also hear expiratory wheezing, which reflects lower airway obstruction. Wheezes often sound similar to a whistle, which is why we've depicted them here with an actual whistle around our ghost hunter's neck. Be sure to check for air movement as well, since a child with severely obstructed airways may not demonstrate much wheezing if they are moving little air. In these kids, it can sometimes be difficult to distinguish transmitted upper airway noises from their rhinorrhea and nasal congestion from lower airway noises. A helpful tip is to put your stethoscope in front of your patient's mouth and nose, then compare those sounds to what you hear on your lung exam. Transmitted upper airway sounds will be the same in both places, whereas lower airway noises should only be present when auscultating the lungs. Bronchiolitis is a clinical diagnosis. Lab work is not routinely indicated, especially for your run-of-the-mill case in the outpatient setting. Viral panels can be considered for hospitalized patients or for those whom the viral panel result might change clinical management. Note that we're not talking about the workup of fever in a neonate here. That's a horse of a different color and outside the scope of this sketch. Imaging is also not routinely indicated in bronchiolitis. The American Academy of Pediatrics, AAP, policy is to avoid imaging in routine bronchiolitis patients, since the hyperinflation, scattered atelectasis, and infiltrates commonly seen do not correlate well with clinical disease severity, and finding them can lead to the administration of unnecessary antibiotics. But... If your patient's presentation is severe enough for an ICU admission, or if there's concern for a possible complication like secondary bacterial pneumonia, then for sure you can go ahead and order that chest x-ray. Chest x-rays in patients with bronchiolitis typically reveal peribronchial cuffing, represented by this hand warmer wrapped around this tree branch, hyperinflation depicted by these overinflated balloons, and or atelectasis represented by these shriveled collapsed balloons. With a consistent history and supporting physical exam findings, you're just about ready to diagnose your patient with bronchiolitis, but it's always a good idea to run through a differential quickly to ensure you're not missing something. Common differentials for bronchiolitis include viral-triggered asthma exacerbation, bacterial pneumonia, pertussis, and foreign body aspiration. Head on over to the differential diagnosis menu to learn more. Now that you're feeling confident about the clinical presentation and diagnosis of bronchiolitis, let's jump into management so you know how to best take care of these kids. The good news is that for the most part, bronchiolitis is a self-limited infection. There's a surprising variability in the clinical management of bronchiolitis, despite updated, evidence-based AAP clinical practice guidelines. Pursuing interventions and therapies that aren't recommended has been associated with an increased length of hospital stay and no change in readmission rate. So keep those AAP guidelines handy as you head onto the wards and into peds clinics. And remember that evidence-based treatment is the way to go. The very first step in your management plan is to evaluate the severity of your patient's illness. During your history and physical exam, pay careful attention to hydration respiratory status, and oxygenation to determine whether hospitalization, represented by the red cross on this tombstone, is indicated or if your patient is safe to stay at home. Indications for hospitalization include dehydration, respiratory distress, apnea, lethargy, a toxic appearance, and an oxygen saturation less than 90 to 95 percent on room air. Keep in mind that you'll want to reassess these kids a few times before making a decision, as the clinical exam can change over time. The most important takeaway from this lesson today is that the mainstay of treatment for bronchiolitis, whether hospitalized or at home, is supportive care, kind of like the supports on this treehouse. For the majority of previously healthy infants with bronchiolitis, there's no indication for the use of medications as part of your management plan. Take note of this treehouse sign to remind you, no meds allowed. There's no reason to routinely give bronchodilators, racemic epinephrine, inhaled or oral glucocorticoids, leukotriene inhibitors, or antibiotics to patients with bronchiolitis. 
None of these treatments have been shown to have benefit. They are all associated with increased costs and could result in adverse effects. Similarly, chest physiotherapy, also called chest PT, is not recommended for patients with bronchiolitis, as there's a no proven benefit and it could result in your patient becoming more agitated and distressed. For hospitalized patients with more severe disease, there are a few other options you can think about. But for the most part, these kids just need time and supportive care too. All patients with bronchiolitis should be placed on contact precautions, including gowns, gloves, and a mask, like these ones you see hung up in the treehouse, to help prevent the spread of viral infection. Nasal suction, often provided in combination with saline nasal drops, is commonly used to help relieve nasal obstruction and can be pretty helpful. It's depicted here by this ghostly dust buster in the treehouse. I wonder if the ethereal HEPA filter is good at getting ectoplasmic goo. Uh, just, no, there's not enough evidence for a formal recommendation one way or another on its use. And make sure to avoid deep suctioning, as it can actually be harmful. You can also try nebulized hypertonic saline in the inpatient setting but it should not be used in the emergency department setting. Monitoring oxygenation status is important for patients with bronchiolitis. It's generally recommended that for stable patients, intermittent oxygen saturation checks should be performed rather than continuous monitoring to avoid the unnecessary use of supplemental oxygen. You can see this represented by this ghost's glowing red human detector ring. Of course, if your patient has severe respiratory distress or is admitted to the ICU, then that's a different story and you'll need more thorough monitoring. If your patient's oxygen saturation dips below 90%, then the use of supplemental oxygen, depicted by this giant green O2 tank, is indicated and can be administered via typical nasal cannula, high-flow nasal cannula, or even CPAP if they need a higher level of support. Intubation may be necessary in severe cases with impending respiratory failure, which is usually manifested by severe retractions, poor or no air entry, lethargy, fatigue, and decreased responsiveness. Patients with bronchiolitis are at an increased risk for dehydration, so you'll need to monitor their I's and O's closely. Small, frequent feeds are recommended in stable patients if their respiratory status allows. Initiation of NG feeds, represented by this nose picker, or IV fluids, represented by the fluid bag-like icicle hanging from the IV vine and dripping water, may be necessary if respiratory distress limits their PO intake, puts them at risk of aspiration if they are vomiting, or their urine output has dropped off. All patients with bronchiolitis, whether at home or hospitalized, will also need frequent monitoring with continual reassessment for the need to escalate or de-escalate care. For hospitalized kids, most pediatric hospitals have bronchiolitis treatment pathways based on AAP guidelines that can be super helpful. In addition to the treatment options we've talked about, it's important to address prevention and risk reduction strategies too. Smoking cessation, good hand hygiene, of the wash sink in the treehouse, and breastfeeding, like this opossum mama is doing, should all be encouraged, since these can help reduce the severity of symptoms and the spread of infection. RSV immunoprophylaxis with palivizumab, also called Synergis, represented by this super pale high-risk ghost sitting next to an antibody-shaped tree branch, is recommended for only a small subset of high-risk patients under one year of age, including preemies born at less than 29 weeks gestation and infants with bronchopulmonary dysplasia or hemodynamically significant cardiac disease. Guidelines and eligibility criteria for palivizumab change yearly, so be sure to check each winter. This is a highly expensive medication, but... It does help reduce the risk of hospitalization for RSV infection in these kiddos. For many patients, the bronchiolitis clinical course is relatively uncomplicated, but you still need to know about potential short- and long-term complications to watch out for, so let's quickly review them. Remember that infants with severe disease, and especially those with underlying conditions, are at a higher risk for complications.
As we mentioned earlier, patients with bronchiolitis are at risk for aspiration pneumonia due to their tachypnea and increased work of breathing. Check out these two ghosts in the corner. They're super freaked out by the sight of a real human in their woods, so much so that one's vomited all over the lung shirt of his buddy. Infants who are struggling with significantly increased work of breathing generally need to be made NPO and provided with enteral or IV hydration to minimize the risk of aspiration. Patients with severe bronchiolitis may progress to respiratory failure and require intubation and mechanical ventilation, represented by this laryngoscope flashlight. Huh. You'd think a ghost wouldn't have trouble seeing in the dark. Eh, you know what they say about assuming. From a long-term standpoint, the most common complication of bronchiolitis is the development of reactive airway disease, recurrent wheezing, or asthma. Note the inhaler in this ghost's mouth. The fear of seeing a human has apparently spun his asthma out of control. This asthma risk seems to be higher among patients that had severe bronchiolitis, those younger than six months, and, of course, among patients with a family history of atopy. So... Be sure to let caregivers know that the child might wheeze with future illnesses and remind them to talk to their pediatrician if this does occur. So there you have it. You're now the master of one of the most common infectious diseases you'll see in pediatrics, especially during cold and flu season. Seeing really is believing. Once you've seen your first case of bronchiolitis, you'll never forget the sound of those classic lung findings. So, before the not-so-friendly ghostly trio shows up, let's take one last look at what we've learned. Bronchiolitis is a self-limited viral illness affecting the lower airway in kids, generally under age 2. It is the most common reason for hospitalization in infants and young children in the USA, and is especially common in the winter months. Bronchiolitis is most commonly caused by respiratory syncytial virus, or RSV for short, but can be caused by other viruses such as rhinovirus, influenza and parainfluenza virus, coronavirus, and more. Bronchiolitis classically presents with one to two days of fever and upper respiratory symptoms such as nasal congestion and rhinorrhea, followed by worsening of symptoms around days three through five with development of lower respiratory symptoms like cough and trouble breathing. The pathophysiology of bronchiolitis involves viral-induced airway edema, increased mucus production, and necrosis and sloughing of airway epithelial cells leading to lower airway obstruction. The physical exam in patients with bronchiolitis generally demonstrates signs of increased work of breathing such as tachypnea, retractions, accessory muscle use, grunting, and nasal flaring, as well as abnormal lung sounds like wheezes and crackles. Luckily, most kids with bronchiolitis do okay. It is generally a self-limiting viral illness, granted a frustrating and scary one for pediatricians and parents alike, that is treated with supportive care. Some kids are at risk for more severe disease. Risk factors include age under 12 weeks, a history of prematurity, chronic lung disease, significant cardiac disease, as well as other social factors such as daycare attendants, school-aged siblings, limited breastfeeding during infancy, and secondhand smoke exposure. RSV prophylaxis is recommended to help prevent bronchiolitis in a small subset of high-risk infants. Those under one year of age with a history of prematurity less than 29 weeks, bronchopulmonary dysplasia, or hemodynamically significant congenital heart disease. Bronchiolitis is a clinical diagnosis. Labs and imaging studies are not indicated in your run-of-the-mill bronchiolitis case but can be considered in special circumstances like severe illness or an unusual illness course. Treatment of bronchiolitis involves knowing what not to do as much as it is knowing what to do. AAP recommendations include avoiding bronchodilators, antibiotics, glucocorticoids, racemic epinephrine, chest PT, and deep suctioning. These do not improve treatment outcomes and can in fact cause more complications. The mainstay of treatment for bronchiolitis in an outpatient setting includes nasal saline drops and suction, small frequent feeds, and monitoring respiratory status and hydration, as well as other standard supportive care measures. Infants with severe bronchiolitis need to be hospitalized for escalation of care. Indications for hospitalization include dehydration, significant increased work of breathing, especially if you are concerned about respiratory fatigue or apnea, poor oxygenation, and lethargy.
Patients who are hospitalized for bronchiolitis may need hydration via enteric or intravenous fluids, frequent suctioning, as well as oxygen support. Respiratory support generally starts with nasal cannula and advances to high-flow nasal cannula, CPAP, or even intubation if needed in severe cases of respiratory failure. Nebulized hypertonic saline is also sometimes tried. Luckily, the vast majority of kids with bronchiolitis, even those who need hospitalization, do well. In the short term, complications of bronchiolitis include aspiration pneumonia and respiratory failure. Those children with severe disease, especially if under six months of age, and those with other comorbidities are at higher risk for developing recurrent wheezing or asthma in the future. And that's it, folks. Our time today is just about up. Hopefully, our ghost hunting friend has enough instant primordial soup mix to go around, or at the very least is pretty talented at helping ghosts take care of their unfinished business. Oh, jeez, uh... Here comes one now. <laughs> Gotta go. See you next time. Check out our other topics on YouTube or go to sketchy.com for our full suite of MCAT and med school lessons. Thanks for listening and stay sketchy out there.